uh, just make sure we have time for kind of our, our brainstorming and our wrap up session. Uh, any final questions for Gibson? OK, we'll dive right in here. All right, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Um, so for this discussion. And again, we want this to be as interactive as possible. And realistically, we pulled forward a lot of the discussion that would happen here, you know, in a meet session and that kind of stuff. So um, I want to continue that energy and we'll have some prompting questions <clears throat> and some discussion to go along with it. So diving right in, um, just a quick review of current capabilities. I mean, obviously we've, we've heard about that, but just want to level set a little bit. Uh, we want to talk about user needs, you know, and especially with respect to adoption. And then we want to look towards kind of future use cases and features. Um, and I think, you know, this presentation, the setup was done uh, obviously previously to some of the discussions we've had, so it may be uh, even a little outdated for today, but we'll proceed. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what the data model captures, obviously it's uh, metadata, measurement metadata, logger configurations, uh, sensor information, mounting information, uh, time zone information, uh, particularly valuable. And of course, things like digital calibrations and, <clears throat> and there's uh, treatment for uh, vertical scanning LIDAR. Oh, sorry. Um, so that's kind of where we are, right? And obviously there's a whole host of, I think other tools and capabilities beyond this, but basically this is where we are and we've released version one. Um, I want to harken back to a survey we did uh, last fall, um, and you know we <clears throat> we really thought that adoption was kind of a primary focus, which is why we put a lot of effort into tools. That's why we spun up this workshop, um, and I think we're I think we're getting there in terms of you know broad based awareness, uh, and what we want to shift to now is really you know how do we help people adopt the model, and you know, the, the kind of loud feedback that we heard was really, you know, there's there's a few parts of adoption. One is just industry adoption. Um, you know, are your peers and are the tools that we're using adopting that? And I think we've heard resoundingly today, yes. Um, you know, WinPro, WinFarmer, uh, EMD, DTU, <coughs> um, DNV, UL, uh, you know, I think the list goes on, which is really, really exciting. RWE, of course, EDF. Um, so that adoption is happening and we just want to make sure that we're providing again the right tools to kind of help make that transition. So oh, oh, weird, sorry. Um, so in the near term, I think we're focused on, you know, magnifying that network effect. And again, things like tutorials, videos, documentation, etc. And then obviously long term, um, you know, how can we improve the, the functionality? Uh, and the interoperability of these things. So um, the way we'll start <clears throat> is uh, pull everywhere. So again, um, maybe Mike, if you can throw a link in the chat for everyone, we'll, we'll start here. Yep, so, one sec. Yeah. <clears throat> so we'd really love to hear, you know, was this workshop useful in explaining the data model? Have we, um, have we improved your understanding? So it seems like we've done a fairly good job of that. Uh, and for those, uh oh, we got one who's not very happy. Uh, maybe that was just a misclick. Um, so first, I'm glad we've done a, an effective job at communicating that. Um, if there are clarifications we can add, feel free to reach out to us directly, type questions in the chat. We want to have that conversation. Um, Next question. 
we really want to understand the use cases at a deeper level. So this is an open response. You can vote up responses that you agree with. <clears throat> and when we think about these use cases, this is what will allow us to, you know, really kind of fine tune the next steps. Oh, you need time. Okay, fair enough. So maybe while we're waiting for this to populate, I'd love to expand on some of these. When you say data stream organization, what does that mean? I'm not sure who posted that, but maybe you can come off mute or type it in the chat. You know, what did Um. Perhaps this is you, um, Morali. I come from NEOM, where we are building multi-gigawatt systems from scratch. We have a huge task at hand in setting up the data and analytics practice for energy and water. I look forward to <coughs> engaging with the WRA team. Thank you. ETU, we will look into having WASP ready to import such format. Um, obviously, interesting comparing with what you're already using in the great form tool set. Um, troubleshooting customer LiDAR deployments. That one's interesting. I heard that. Um, yeah, I think this, is, this can also be a great way to ensure quality in the measurement uh, deployment phase. Um, CF adopted. So this is the previous uh, framework that we were talking about. So this is again an, another piece of looking at how we connect maybe to other standards. So it seems like a, a good majority of folks are actually looking at implementing this internally, um, some data, data, database or otherwise. You want to build products and tools that leverage the model to help your customers. So really starting to build the ecosystem. That's exciting. Allow us to accept WRI data in a uniform format as a plug-in to yield assessment and design tools, interfacing with clients. Excellent. Um, all right, that's really helpful, actually, to help us understand the use cases. One of our challenges is to understand how this data model can be expanded to include time series performance data of turbines. That, so just specifically on, we'll say operational analysis, that's an entirely different ball of wax. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in many ways, much more complicated. Um, but certainly we have lots of thoughts on that in particular. Let's see, all right. Um, Next question, sorry. What are the biggest barriers to adoption of this in your workflows? I think maybe we've, we've heard a few of those in the previous question like time. Um, user interface, okay. Yeah, so this this idea of connectors, I think, to historical practices and data is really important. OK, 
convince sponsors within the company to give a budget to implement this. Modeled and measured data together with the common vocabulary. Time and resource. Yeah. The uh, I can talk the mapping current model structure to task 43. Yeah, that that can be uh, a difficult challenge if uh, there's a big gap between the two databases. Um, it'd be interesting for people that are starting to tackle that for themselves. Um, they're, they're the people that can see gaps in the structure that we've got and maybe they can reach out and contribute, help us fill in those gaps if there are any. Um, when they're trying to map them together. Um, I, I would definitely take a look at the task 43, the, the database that we have. We've been using it for years in Brightwind and it captures everything that's changed. We came across a MetMast in Argentina once and the whole top section changed completely. It was side mounted anemometers, went to goalpost, different heights, different sensors. Sensors that was connected to channel one, for instance, was connected to channel 13 or something. It was an absolute disaster of a mess to deal with. And what is one of the reasons why we really had to capture all this information and be able to track changes over time. Um, so it satisfied, satisfied. That was our that was our test. Can it satisfy this mass? And I think it does. So if people are going to do some mapping current model to the task 43 one, I'd love to hear your experiences and see if you got some good suggestions for us. OK. <clears throat> So I just want to roll back for a second. You know, it seems like realistically, if I'm if I'm distilling this, there's a few maybe a few things that are really the challenges. One, um, you know, internal time and resources, and finding the right justification to you know, do the work to spin up the database and make these connectors and that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, dealing with legacy structures is really important. Um, you know, reach the minimum number of users as critical mass to be adopted as a standard. Uh, you know, I I think what I, I just want to put out that um, this workshop is fairly well attended. I think we had a ton of registrations. Um, we've heard from a number of companies, developers, consultancies, equipment manufacturers that they are going to implement this. So. I'm less concerned about critical mass at this point. I think we're we're actually starting to get there. Um, but there are logistics pieces like how do we deal with legacy standards, um, connection to other standards, et cetera, uh, and of course the time and resource issue. Um, user interface, which you know may support the kind of time and resource issue. Um, and can I ask? Be, yeah. uh, sorry, if you back up. The critical mass, um, like how, whoever wrote that or voted, like, can I ask, uh, how do you measure that? Well, what is the number, the magical number? <laughs> like, um, yes, I, it was me. <laughs> it's a big, because um, I also re written and the other question: what, what is the uh, understanding? What is the critical mass? One of the yeah. my answers so. because I mean uh, yeah this uh, this is something that came from the community the European Commission I mean they want to have the number of viable number of uh, institutions to uh, use uh, this uh, open science cloud initiative which is uh, linking data from different institutions 
So that's why. And then also something about uh, uh, Rel told me when I showed what we have done that they will not adopt anything that is not a standard recognized for other industry. So this critical mass is uh, something that came out different times mm. in the, the last four or five years <laughs> that I've been working with these things. So that's why I said this is one of the barriers because uh, yeah. and, uh, it's a kind of going around. There is no physical mass, nobody uses, and then, then nobody uses uh, to reach a, a physical mass. Yeah, yeah, like uh, to be like we're part of the IEA Task 43, we're not a standardization body or anything like that. To make it a standard, we could go to IEC and put it under an IEC umbrella. And then it would be a standard to get adopted. But that's, I think, a forceful approach. You can get to a standard by the more people that use it in the industry, the more wind analysts that use it, the more naturally it becomes a standard. Um, so it's like, which comes first? It's a chicken and egg thing. If you, yeah, that do you need the <laughs> standard first from IEC or? Do more people just use it because it's the best thing to use and it's beneficial for everyone? It then just naturally becomes the standard. I'd like to go with I, that approach as opposed to the stick. I agree. The I think my approach is a bottom up. I mean, just to, to use it and then to, to be, that becomes a yeah. standard because if you go and then it's open access. It's every, everybody knows as a, it's, you don't have to pay a lot of money to get the standards. So it's just in, wanna... innovation, digitalization. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we can just, um, when it comes to like the IEC process in particular, it I don't know that it's actually aligned with this concept of digitalization. Specifically, things like, you know, we're, we're trying to get an IEC GitHub repository formally accepted. We're trying to get these kind of JSON formats formally accepted. And to some extent, it's orthogonal to the way that IEC works now with written documents and very specific um, kind of outcomes and deliverables. So my hope is something like, you know, this can actually disrupt a bit the way that the IEC works and force them into the future. Right? And I say that participating in the IEC, so. I agree. Uh, Peter, I think you have a comment. Yeah, just I think to pick up on that, I think largely to agree. I think it's it's um, probably premature to mandate anything to do with data models in the IEC process. Um, but I do think I do think eventually it will get adopted. Um, but yeah, the the and the, the process is that the, there has to, the industry has to there has to have been some industry experience first for the IEC to then codify. Uh, that in a standard in the industry doesn't necessarily have the experience yet. Um, so yes, the, the, the way that's been proposed, this bottom-up approach, putting this out, getting it adopted, that's absolutely the, the right approach, I think. And But I think there is room for it in the IEC documents because of the way that they've been disaggregated now to have a whole series of the Dash 50 series that are about measurements, um, you know, that are about... <laughs> generating data i think it's totally legitimate that that at some point will then you know the, the the adoption of data models will then be reflected in how those iec documents develop in time so i imagine you know we'll see that the like the the, the second edition of the whole dash 50 series maybe in a couple of years time or something we might see this being reflected in in those discussions yep and and I should say that I think the most efficient way to produce a standard is to have something that's already being used and is functional. Um, yeah. Creating something from the ground up in the standards process is incredibly cumbersome. Yeah. So this this is absolutely the the right precursor step to something like that. Mark, I think you raised your hand. Yeah. The the, the other approach would be to sort of take the national approach where when you look at the the efforts to make data public in the UK through the Marine Data Exchange, for example, you go into that the data exchange and the data is all over the place in terms of uh, metadata and the data itself. So if the Crown Estate were to say adopt this standard, then that, that would be really helpful too. And similarly with the American Clean Power. 
yeah, that's a good idea. And we, you know, we have been in conversation, I think, with when Europe in particular, their digitalization task force, and I think uh, American Clean Power may be a little behind in their uh, formation of something like that, but great suggestions. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. Um, I want to plow forward next question, but thank you. A great, great conversation. Um, what new capabilities would really be most helpful for adoption? So, you know, we've, I think we've highlighted some examples from our experience. Obviously, this isn't uh, totally inclusive of all the potential solutions, but of these, which would be most helpful? And I should say, I apologize. Normally, I include the total number of responses. Um, on average, I think we're getting about 60 responses in the earlier questions, at least. So to give you a sense of the the sample size. <clears throat> I hope uh, Tom Lambert, Tobias and Elizabeth are still on. <laughs> uh, it's overwhelming. More than half uh, think that an import export functions commercial software yeah. would be a massive help, which I agree. Absolutely. Excellent. OK. Mm. So yeah, I think that's a pretty strong signal there. Um, so I want to open up the adoption discussion real quick and again we're focused on adoption now we'll move to the kind of new feature uh, discussion in a minute which i think should be lively um but open answer open-ended question what would be most helpful in helping you get started with the data model um could be any of the things we talked about before like the um you know having this functionality in industry software or anything else Yeah, I suppose the previous answers um, before was time and resource. So let's top the list. How can how can we help you not spend so much time? tutorials detail webinar i hope this webinar is recorded so um i hope what we did earlier would help um just i think some more blogs or tutorials on how to deal with specific things like um like a sensor change and then that you put two of them in i was trying to explain that a bit um how to incorporate lidar data or or the 3D sonic sensor, how to deal with that. And um, yeah, they're all things that we could do. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I think we're hearing pretty strongly tutorials. Um, maybe going down that path just a little bit. Uh, useful feedback. Um, the example create a JSON output would be helpful. So um, so sharing code that can be used for implementing it and using it for different applications. Uh, I think we should expand upon this a bit. I, there is a good amount of code that already exists um, for using it. For example, you know, uh, to spin up a database or to populate the model, et cetera. Uh, we can always improve on that. Also, I should say, 
uh, you know, things like the Brightwind open source analysis tool kind of natively work with the data model, and that allows you to extend it into interesting places. Um, yeah, I was going to mention that at the end, but I ran out of time. No, it, but that's really, I think there's, you know, that's really the next step is, you know, once the once the data model is kind of formalized and adopted, then you can start doing the really interesting and, and fun things, um, such as in Brightland. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I think resoundingly tutorials, user guide, webinar tutorial, etc. Excellent. Um, focus on tools, parsers for the data model. Um, interesting, the only one that's been downvoted is a clear demand from customers to include this data model. Uh, you know, if anything, I think the discussion today has demonstrated there's a, a clear interest. Um, but hopefully that's reflected in the one on one conversations between, uh, you know, software providers and their their community. Um, <clears throat> yeah, going back to get going back to Gibson slides, um, the users that we know are the organizations, the customers, the WinFrame developers, you've got RWE and EDF and Transalta. I mean, uh, there are some other WinFrame developers, but we didn't get hold of them for permission to say their name, but we know there are other WinFrame developers implementing it. Um, they're the ones that we know of. Because it's an open source repository, we have no idea who's looking at it or or tracking it. So if if there are other uh, wind farm developers on this call that are using it already, uh, please let us know because that gives us more. You're the customer, and um, that comment, uh, you know, that that gives. Uh, ammunition to Tom and Tobias and Elizabeth to go back to their organizations to put this feature into their software so we can all have it. Uh, yeah. So is is there any other person on this call, part of a wind farm developer that's using the data model or has looked at it? Don't be shy. Um. Oh. Yeah, and I would just say, as far as tutorials and user guides go, I think there's a there's a next step to think about use cases and those kind of things. So I think we'll definitely have to walk through that. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a clear message. Uh, it's tutorials and user guides we should be focused on, and it's kind of what we were thinking of anyway. And in, in your slide, Jason, you had the next six months tutorials. Um. So. It, I want to shift gears a little bit and really talk about you know, some of the future possibilities. Um, you know, extend model to support floating LIDAR, scanning LIDAR, uh, probably more robust treatment of maintenance records, solar. Um, I think you might have some comments on this, Stephen, in terms of what it can and can't do. Yeah, it's pretty much works for solar. We use it already for solar. Um, a lot of the measurement types and units and everything are already in there uh, and I when I was showing the logger measurement configs we got slope and offset but sensitivity for pyranometers sensitivity is used and um, so it covers quite a lot of solar already if there's some solar experts out there um, that sees a gap let us know create an issue on the github and we'll put it in um <clears throat> So yeah, I've largely kind of bucketed this into kind of uh, extending the model to support various uh, applications, but also, you know, can we improve the functionality of the underlying model? Things like validation of the data, um, database deployment, connectors to other data models, etc. Um, <clears throat> so another quick poll, um, and again. I encourage you to come off mute, throw out some ideas, uh, throw things in the chat. Uh, you know, we had some interesting things earlier. I think someone was asking about, you know, can we do something for um, 
Okay. Model data. Um, that's another kind of interesting use case where, you know, can we <clears throat> can we wrap um, virtual measurement, virtual met mass data, or reference data? I think that's an interesting use case. Quite a lot of yeah, interest. just on. Yeah. But, um, seeing as you mentioned virtual MMS data, like reanalysis data, if you think about uh, reanalysis data sets, it's a node, a grid covering the world, a node. So that node is at a location. So there's your location. It's a measurement location. And then it has a wind oh. speed. So mirror two is 50 meter wind speed. Uh, and there are measurement points. So the data model is far more extensive uh, than for what's needed for reanalysis data, which can easily be used for reanalysis data. So location and a height above ground. So I, I just want to, this is interesting to me, like the, the majority of the interest that we're seeing is actually in kind of processing tools, data processing tools, so mass shadow filtering, IEC compliance, quality control. Um, Obviously, there's interest in kind of extending to uh, adjacent technologies, but you know, a third of respondents really want to see some tools. I think for doing these things. So, one. Um, yeah, I think I think on that topic, uh, I think it goes back to the willingness of people who want to see this in software packages like uh, WinPro or Windographer and so on because uh, people likely want to do this kind of things like mass shadow, for example, are features that are part of the software packages. And uh, so I think that it, if, if you don't have access to those software, probably you want to do that via some other sort of coding. So which I, I don't I think underlines the, the, the part and how important is to also have a, a software package involved or that a software package can get the data model so we can do that kind of task, mass shadow filtering, IC compliance and so on. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, just from a, an ethos perspective, um, you know, the data model, I think, lifts all boats fundamentally. If we can get to our work faster, um, then that benefits everyone in the ecosystem. And you know, where that where that line starts to become fuzzy is really in these kind of analytics, you know, data processing tools. Um, let's see. So Tom, I think you uh, so there's a request, elaborate more on extending to maintenance documentation. Um, so I mean Steven or Amit, please. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in. I voted for that. Um, <laughs> you know, the tools, I completely understand the interest in tools, and that's an important part. But we, you know, Andrew Black and Weissel had touched on, you know, you can bring the maximum benefit, the, you know, the further upstream you go in the analysis. And the maintenance document, I think, are on the starting point of that analysis. And in terms of use, you know, we have the it's, it's wind resource assessment. So a lot of this really focuses on analyst work. But upstream of that, we have the people, data managers who are often overseeing these fleets of, you know, large number of masts sometimes. So, you know, from a scale perspective, I think they also stand to benefit if the data did come in in a digitized model. Gibson touched on this as well. So that's where I see um, a need as well. And, and I'm hoping that mast installers, as well as uh, I know we had Heiko still here and Matthias here, and maybe more folks from calibration labs. And so if installers and calibration labs are sort of on board with this, then I think it would make um, it, it, adopting the model, I think can help you know, really get adopted early on and, and propagate downstream from there. Sure. So, yeah, that really good. Thank you. Um, so I'll I'll loop back to your question, uh, Tom, but I do want to 
bring up Joel's question, which is, can you please elaborate on solar extension? So, you know, basically the idea is, and according to Stephen, it the the model is already flexible enough that can you know, largely incorporate solar pre-construction measurements. Um, I don't know if there's any explicit modifications that need to be made, um, or maybe we should engage in the same way the uh, you know wind equipment manufacturers if, if there are solar measurement equipment manufacturers uh, that should be engaged for example um, so I think that's what we mean is you know this increasingly renewable development is a multi-technology uh, approach and game and so whether that's solar plants wind plants or hybrids I think you know having some cognizance of adjacent technologies which we might have to deal with. Uh, does that does that answer your question, Joel? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Tom, Jason, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you know, since we were just touching on solar, the one thing I'd like to add is to, we're certainly using it for solar. It's definitely flexible enough to get you 90% there. Um, there are some quirks in solar, I feel, relative to wind, where from the logger you can get data, you, know, you can get the, the measurement, for example, the, one of the GHI measurements, but you may get many variations of post-processing on that data, which is something maybe we don't quite support natively well enough, but this is exactly where I think it would be great to help have help from you know analysts who are working with both wind and solar, is we need that final bit of tweaking to make it really flexible. So um, I think with solar, we're really, really close. And you know, if you're interested in using the same model for wind and solar and not have to switch to solar for, for a data model, then please come in and help us like get there for the last mile. Absolutely. Uh, and Tom, yeah, I'm pretty confident we, we've, we've, I go 99% to meet. <laughs> Not ninety percent. The way that that slight, slight mm -hmm. would, um, but yeah. And uh, Tom, I just want to I want to loop back to your comment. Um, maybe you want to express it. Yeah, um, it, yeah. It was just sort of saying, in, in a way, the the data model validation tools are kind of a an outlier in there. Um, at the end of the day, none of us on this call are in the business of fiddling around with data validation. We're in the business of getting turbines built and kind of A through D and F are about, yeah, let's let's get some turbines built or, or some solar panels built. Um, I think data validation tools, they're a really impo important part of the framework, but I think, I think you guys are there. I mean, every single language, whether it's, you know, JavaScript on the front end or C++, Rust, Python, MATLAB, they all have JSON schema validators. So you're there out of the box already. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's kind of an outlier in the question, not that it's important. It just kind of doesn't quite mesh with the question. Sure. One, one thing that I have uh, to comment on all of these extensions um, essentially A through D, is it, it's worth noting that JSON schema are refable and nestable. Um, so we kind of don't want to get up into a situation where we have one massive JSON schema that covers all of this equipment. Uh, let, let's create uh, some modular chunks and that way actually schema can be made in maintainable lumps and referred together. Uh, I, I can help with that if anyone uh, if anyone needs. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, point. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. Like for vertical scanning lighters, we have a little section that's part of it, but not used for MetMass, but it's there yeah. for vertical scanning lighters. Um, be interesting to see how that would work. Yeah, um, if if you like, Stephen, we could make this a case study in the within the uh, metadata challenge. Actually, we could look at that in a bit more detail um, in in those conversations over there. 
Ja. Dat is goed. Excellent. Um, Oaken, I think you had a comment around floating LiDAR systems. Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jason. So um, in a last project, we, we have worked, for example, there when you have a floating measurement campaign, you might have uh, redundant systems and then it is very likely that uh, one of the system will fail and then you need to have either replace the LiDAR within the floating LiDAR system and then um, sometimes you have a new system which needs to be which needs to have a, a pre-deployment verifications and you have at the end of the day maybe 10 different units uh, some of them have different uh, LiDAR units and you need to trace all these pre-deployment verifications onshore LiDAR verifications it is really very cumbersome so it would be great to have a um, extension and really have this uh, information uh, at hand um, so this um, I think might be helpful for for the offshore industry especially Excellent. yeah as as mentioned uh, earlier we've already kicked off the conversations with some floating lidar uh, manufacturers, providers, um, we're having a second call in two weeks time. I think it's two weeks. Uh, send us a message and we, if you want to be invited along to contribute, that would be great. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, and final poll, I think we'll move to wrap up soon with uh, Mike Perdue, but just open ended question. What new feature would be most useful for you? I think we've heard, you know, <clears throat> a variety of different, uh, you know, applications which the model could be extended to. But open-ended question for all of those on the line. Um, <laughs> floating ladder capability, sure. <laughs> uh, and while we're waiting on some some additional ideas there, uh, I would just mention that uh, these meetings are Thursday in the if you're in the US, they're Thursday mornings. Uh, I think if you're in Europe, uh, they're Thursday <clears throat> afternoon or evening. Um, so we meet weekly uh, again, uh, kind of weekly sprints or I should say biweekly sprints. Uh, on specific topics like floating LIDAR or digital calibrations, etc. So um, we encourage everyone to join those meetings uh, as you can and contribute your expertise or your ideas and all of the above. Um, so floating LIDAR is fairly popular. Data transformer, how to migrate between subsequent versions of schema. Easy interface for mast installers. So popular. Parser from OEMs to the data model. And yeah, I think just anecdotally, uh, that's that's certainly on the the OEMs. I, NRG Systems, for example, is uh, doing that kind of natively in their <clears throat> in their system, and they're working on that. Um, I expect we'll see more uh, Weisla, uh, another example. So I think we'll see more of that from the OEMs uh, going forward. Interesting. So this interface for mast installers seems quite popular. Mm, that's good. Floating light capability, <clears throat> schema migration, version migration, search feature to find data, a way of handling data verification, calibrations validated by wind tunnel facility, mass configuration, validated by installation company. Scanning and floating LIDARs. OK. Um, excellent. Well, I just want to open up. I want to close uh, this this kind of discussion um, and say thank you to everyone who's participated. I think it's really helpful for the development team. Um, I'll offer up uh, any final questions, comments, concerns uh, before we move to wrap up. Please throw them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will pass it to Mike.